Good day, everyone, um, and welcome to our webinar today on interpretable preventative maintenance for hard drives. My name is Andy Klein, and I'm from Backblaze. And joining me in just a couple of minutes will be Daisy Zia of Interpretable. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the webcast is being recorded. So if you uh, miss some of it or you want to pass it on to your colleagues or whatever, it's the same URL that you use to register with. So that it's always great. Uh, down at the bottom, there's an attachments tab. Uh, you can use that. We've put a lot of different uh, resources down there for you, including the presentation uh, and a lot of the things that are mentioned to, in today's presentation for you via links and so on. Uh, there's also a questions tab down there. So at any time during the presentation, you can actually uh, go through, put in a question. We'll get to them at the end, uh, as many as we can, as long as we have time for it. If we don't get to your question, uh, we'll actually answer it via email. So we, we won't leave you out. With that, uh, let me welcome Daisy uh, from Interpretable. Daisy, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and the rest of your cast of characters and go on from there. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Andy. So my name is Daisy Drew. I'm one of the founding partners at the Interpretable AI. So a little more background about our company. We started about three and a half years ago out of MIT. Um, so my partner Jack and myself were PhD students with uh, Professor Dimitris Bertsimus. And as you can see, he is uh, very experienced in the area of uh, both machine learning and optimization with over 30 years uh, at, uh, at both school and also doing industrial work. Um, he's currently the Associate Dean for Business Analytics at MIT Sloan. Um, he's also very well known as a serial entrepreneur. His philosophy is that, you know, we're not just doing research for the sake of research, um, but really we want to bring um, the real value into um, into problems, whether it's in healthcare, it's in machines, or uh, it's in banking. So he influenced a lot of the research that Jack and myself did during our PhD time with him. And we're very also motivated to, you know, not just finding the next uh, better and bigger neural network that saw finds cats and differently from dogs, better from pictures, but actually coming up with the methodologies that help businesses make better decisions. Uh, and hopefully throughout the talk, you can get a glimpse of how we address the problem of hard drive maintenance using some of the interpretable AI technologies that we developed both at MIT and now here at Interpretable AI. So yeah, as a company, you know, we, we work on both the research side of things of coming up with new methodologies, but also on the application side where we work with companies to, to help them that go from research into production. So the key motivation for why we were interested in the Backblaze uh, data um, and the hard drive problem, when we were students, we actually have been following um, the Backblaze hard drive data and stats since uh, I think when it came out, Jack was the one that uh, found out about it and was like, hey, look, this is one of the richest and the cleanest data sets. Um, it's got you know over 130,000 hard drives. The, the, the like metrics are all very nicely organized and normalized. And there must be some value you, know, you can get from this data some of these metrics must correlate very well with the overall health of these drives. And maybe the relationship is complex. Maybe it's a more difficult than just a single analysis. But it would be really cool to come up with some methodology and apply it to this data set so that we can draw some insights and help with the decision making down the road. So obviously, we, the data has been out there for a while, and we're not the only people in researchers that have been interested um, in working with the data. Backblaze itself had done some univariate analysis um, where it identified a, a bunch of uh, smart metrics that are important predictors for the hard drive failure. So specifically, you know, we listed five of uh, these uh, smart uh, fe metric features that they identified in their study. And similarly, Google did another study where they did a more detailed correlation analysis and found, you know, some of them were correlated, some were relevant. So, you know, they had some of their own findings of uh, how each individual um, smart metric related to the outcome of uh, these drives. Um, so aside from them, then there's a whole other stream of research going on here, just mentioning a couple where they used the more modern 
machine learning methods such as uh, random forest and neural networks. Uh, both of them are black box models, and I explain in a second what that means. Um, and because of the nature of these methods, it did limit the practical usefulness of uh, what they found. So, you know, they can no longer give you a simple list of, you know, 5, 187. Um, these are important ones. Um, they, they, they just say, hey, we have this really good model that tells you whether the drive is going to fail or not, and please trust us. Um, so in addition to the black box nature, these studies also require a lot of data. Um, so if I remember, a lot of them require at least 100,000 observations, and you have to observe them over multiple years if you want to do kind of a cross-year analysis. Um, so again, it may limit some of the applicability of these methods. Um, and just some background, uh, I've been talking about the black box methods that some of the, uh, the researchers have been using. So these are the ones where here's an example in the medical field where, you know, you have a patient that comes in and he tells you everything about himself. He's 30, he's a male, all his labs. And the black box model just crunches these numbers. And in the end, it tells you a magic number that the mortality risk is, uh, say, 26% here. It doesn't tell you why, it doesn't tell you which feature of this person is mostly important in coming up with the feature, sorry, with the, the prediction. It just simply kind of, you know, say this is what our machine thinks. On the other hand, the interpretable model, and that's going to be the basis of both this analysis and uh, us as a company, kind of as a philosophy, is something that's very easy to, it's, you know, like right there, it's transparent, you can just follow. Um, so in this example, because this person has age over 25, and because it's a male, and now we predict the mortality rate to be 26%. So now for every prediction, you can get the exact rationale behind it and you can, you know, verify it or test it. You can ask the doctor if that makes sense. You can discuss this with, uh, you know, family members and, you know, like it's a lot more evidence for someone to, to again, make decisions based on rather than just trusting a sing single number. So at this point, you might say, oh, interpretable methods sounds great. Why don't we just use it all the time? So in practice, obviously, there is still an unfortunate trade-off. So for, you know, traditional methods like regression, CART, univariate analysis, you know, some of the methods that the older Backblaze and Google study used have great interpretability. You know, they tell you, hey, this variable is important because we have a coefficient of this. Um, but they often suffer in performance their predictive power is typically not as strong as some of the more modern methods out there. Things like you know, neural network, deep learning, random forest boosting, uh, a lot of the methods behind some of the more recent papers uh, with this data have been using. So as practitioners, you always have to choose, hey, is this business problem more important to have high interpretability or we want just like the state of the art performance? And uh, as you probably guess, the, this nice corner is where we strive to achieve. So that's indeed a kind of, you know, the, again, the focus of our research back at MIT. And now that this method that we used it for today's uh, um, presentation. Um, so we developed the methods like optimal classification tree, sparse regression, imputation, where now by using the power of, uh, of optimization and uh, modern computing, we can actually still keep the same architecture as a traditional card tree or regression, but now achieve actually better performance. And I'll talk about what, how we did it for optimal classification tree in just a second. And we ran a series of uh, analysis with real world data and we published in top journals showing that uh, in, in performance in terms of you know, accuracy, R squared, um, survival metrics, they're all part of uh, of these models that are shown here. So now it gives us the really nice part where we no longer have to make a choice or a sacrifice, but indeed just to start with interpretability and no, there's no need to worry about where you would land on the performance landscape.
So a lot of the details are actually outlined in this uh, paper that uh, my partners, Dimitris Bertsimus and Jack, have written, I think, uh, two, a year and a half ago. Um, so again, it covers techniques co uh, from optimal decision trees, uh, which is the main technology used for this problem, uh, imputation, which was the topic of my thesis, um, and optimal feature selection. Um, so all of these techniques, again, are offered by us as a company, as software, um, but the core or like uh, mathematics, if you want to dig into all the, uh, the equations, they're all covered in the book. And it could be something of interest um, if you, you do want to learn some more details. So talking about the optimal trees, the method behind um, you know, what we use here, it's a new method that, that produces still a single interpretable tree that users can follow and validate. Um, but now it's different from a traditional decision tree. So if you remember, um, you know, a traditional decision tree looks like something like this and it finds out, hey, what's the most important variable to split? Uh, this is for a real estate platform um, and it, it crunches the data and it says, oh, whether it's the first sale on the platform is the, the most important split. So it finds that and then it splits the tree into two leaves left and right, giving them different sales probability. And then it asks the next question, okay, what's the next the best variable to, to, to split? So again, it kind of goes through this process sequentially or known in optimization greedily, um, and it comes up with a tree that predicts pretty well, but you can imagine because of the greedy nature here, it actually is not necessarily the best or the simplest the tree you can get here, right? Perhaps if you take a global view here, the interior condition is actually best to be used as the first split. And based on the interior condition, the next split variables could be very different from what's presented here. So now you can see there's a room for improvement. If you can train this entire tree holistically, rather than one step at a time, you can gain some of the gap that the traditional approach couldn't get um, when it's put in comparison against the black box model. So now, um, you know, you know, after a brief introduction to the methodology itself, we want to come back to this hard drive lifespan problem. So the specific questions we want to address covers two, um, two main areas. And you know, we, we have three exact problems that we, we solved in the paper. The first one is the short-term detection of failure. So can you detect in you know, one to three months whether this machine is going to fail and what's the probability of failure? And we think that's an important problem because it's a it's a very kind of a tactic, um, you know. Like if you have a good prediction, then you could start, you know, making repairs or taking down the drives, and making backups. Um, all of these tactic decisions can be based on um, your a good prediction in that in that sense. The second part that we're interested in is the long-term failure probability, and we are mostly interested in that for two reasons. One of them is just an understanding, right? At first, we talked about the motivation, why this problem is in interesting to us, is that there's just so much signal nowadays with IoT device and with all these smart metrics on, on hard drives. It, we, we want to understand what, what kind of uh, signals correlate with the outcome. So it's not necessarily just for the prediction, but actually for our own understanding as well. So that's one aspect of why the long-term failure is interesting to us. The second one is for, you know, if you have a good prediction, then for strategic planning and for operational forecasts, you might have a better sense on, you know, over the next year or two, how many um, drives are going to fail, um, how do you kind of adjust your, your action according to that. So we look at the long term into two phases. One of them is that if you have the luxury of the data over the entire time period, how do you learn and make the predictions? And the second one, which we thought is the most interesting, is that what if you can't actually observe the entire time? Um, can, can you actually still make a good prediction or learning this long term behavior uh, without, without that kind of data? Um, so, like, you know, spoiler, it, you, you can, but I, I'll talk about exactly how we did it. 
So this, again, this paper was recently published in Machine Learning with Applications. Um, I believe the exact paper or link is uh, shared uh, in one of the, the shared uh, items that uh, you, you can download as well. All right, so let's dive into the details for these three specific problems we're solving. The first one on the short-term health, what we do is we look at the, this metric called remaining useful life for each drive over the 90-day window. And here's an illustration on how we exactly manipulate the data. So for a given drive, suppose this is the time of a failure, and you can take any 90-day marching window and you can say, hey, did you fail or not? And if you didn't fail, then we would know that the remaining useful life is at least 90 days for any of these observations. And note that at each time, your metric is different, right? Like as you're going through time, um, you know, today's measurement is different from tomorrow's measurement. So these are all kind of, you know, like different, uh, different observations in the data that can help you understand as your metrics um, change. Um, does that affect your final remaining useful life? Now things get interesting. So failure happens and you can see, okay, now this observation has only a remaining useful life of 89 days. And this guy only has 88 days. Eventually you get one observation where it's a one or zero day left. So with even just data from a single drive, you can see that we can already obtain about 90 observations that collects information on you know, what kind of uh, metrics here that would lead to better um, outcome where they didn't fail versus what kind of metrics down here in the orange where they would lead to much shorter remaining useful time. And another benefit here is that since it's a short time period, we can observe the outcome of most drives. So there is not really a lot of restriction on what kind of data we can use. Um, so we tested with just a subset of uh, 16,000 or so observations. And we trained an optimal survival tree, which again is like, you know, a decision tree like you saw before, but instead of predicting a single number, it predicts a whole survival curve. And I'll show you what the curve looks like in just one second. So um, here I'm showing you the tree that we trained for the short-term health. And the features here we used are both the raw and normalized smart metrics. Um, so you can see, you know, depending on whether the metric five raw number is a low or high, it kind of generally separates into the, cl um, the clusters on the left, which uh, typically has longer um, remaining useful time, the darker blue ones versus the ones on the right, which have lighter blue, um, also you know, kind of short, uh, shorter remaining lifetime. So it keeps finding these splits. And again, remember these optimal decision trees find all of the splits kind of holistically rather than one at a time. So even though we're reading it one at a time, this entire tree is actually optimized globally. And I highlighted two of the most extreme cohorts that we found. One of them are, is the, the one that has the highest uh, remaining useful time, almost at the full 90 days. And one of those is uh, on the other extreme where it's only got 11 days. So we can actually characterize these uh, cohorts better. Um, so rather than just uh, finding out what the average um, remaining useful time is, you can actually, it empirically fits these survival curves so that it shows, you know, for some of them, it uh, like declines very rapidly and stops. Some of them declines completely to zero and stops, whereas uh, in some other cohorts, uh, it just remains pretty much constant at the full survival. So um, the, for example, this cohort correspond to this one where it has the perfect, almost perfect uh, survival pattern. So I hope that's clear. That's an example of this uh, short-term health analysis. Again, you know, if we focus on a short-term kind of tactic problem, we can put an optimal survival tree on top of it and really learn um, what kind of smart metrics lead to different patterns in survival curves that you can see for the hard drives. Now we're moving to the long-term problem. So if we have the luxury of you know, observing the data over the entire, say, three-year period, 
the problem setup is actually exactly the same as the short term one, right? You have these uh, drives, you can like watch them and see if they failed in any of the three year period. And if it did, then you change the remaining useful time to a much shorter time and you can combine all of this data together and put it into the tree. Um, but I think what's interesting here is that if you take a long-term tree and compare it with a short-term tree, you can actually find some differences between the two. So namely, um, we found that the smart metric 537187, which I think actually overlapped pretty well with what the Backblaze found in their univariate analysis, these features affect both short-term and long-term health of the drive. You can see them showing up kind of you know, everywhere or throughout the tree. But what's more interesting is that there are some features that are more specific to the short term and some more specific to the long term. And in particular, what we found that uh, smart metric 190 uh, is more specific to the short term and 197 is more specific for the long term. So we think, you know, this kind of insight could be useful to, you know, talk with someone who's uh, familiar with exactly what the meaning of these uh, metrics are and perhaps to discuss, does that make sense? Um, if not, is there any anything special about the, the measurement of uh, these, uh, uh, these metrics? Are they related? Are they kind of just variations of each other, but with a slight different focus? So finally, we want to talk about the third scenario that we analyzed. Obviously, it's great if we have three years of data for all of the drives, but this may not be a reality, right? Some drives may not even be in production by then. So it's very important if we can learn from the data, even if the data is not complete. Um, so if we only have one year of data for some of the drives, we would still like to get some insight from it. So here we outline three different cases. Um, and the first one is if the drive failed before one year, that's great because we observe you know, exactly what happened before one year and we know it just remained failed after, between the one year and three year. So it's not really different from how we did our approach earlier. And case three, similarly, if it, if we get to observe it for three years and it, we know it did not fail after the three years, that's also great because we know again exactly kind of uh, at the three year mark, the drive still remains healthy and, uh, um, and that's another good data point. The complication happens when there is uh, uh, in case two where the drive fails between one and three years. And we don't know when, right? Because we just observed at one year mark. So we know the drive survived all the way up to one year, but we don't really know exactly between one and three years, what time did it fail? Or maybe even after three years, we just don't know. So this now will require a specific kind of treatment. Um, so if you're familiar with survival analysis, you may have heard that these are censored data meaning that you don't actually know exactly what happened at a given time. So at one year, you know that it, uh, it did not fail, but we don't know if it uh, failed at uh, what time after that. So typical approaches would just kind of discard these uh, sensor data. Um, and you know, you would just train your normal regression or classification with the case one and the case three data. But the nice thing about uh, our optimal decision tree suite is that it actually has the native support built in to deal with these sensor data. It actually learns the signal from it and allow us to use it effectively. So remember that you know these ones, even though we don't really know exactly it failed, we still know it survived up to one year. And that's still useful information, right? Because we know that uh, with whatever metrics that we observed, at least it's good for a year. So that should be telling us something. They should be more important in terms of predicting a healthier drive for those that failed before one year. So censoring kind of allowed us to use that data point still and gain insight from it. And the final model that we used to train um, just the 50,000 records uh, in comparison is actually similarly accurate with full data. And here is an example of how the tree looks with the individual survival curves. 
Yeah, so um, I, I hope that gives you some kind of, you know, like a, an overview of what we did with uh, the optimal decision trees on the hard drive data from Backblaze. Um, from our, you know, exercise, we thought there's a few advantages that it brought to predictive maintenance compared to either the univariate analysis or the black box ones. The first one is that now we have these very well-defined interpretable paths to failure, right? Remember those, uh, um, those uh, boxes or cohorts with very short remaining useful time. So now if you trace it down and you say, oh, it's because metric five is too high and metric, metric 190 is too low, blah, blah, blah. Now you can actually kind of nicely have this uh, uh, physically or mathematically kind of define the group of hard drives and that can be a useful basis for a discussion with someone to actually see if there's something systematic going on and it can be improved. Um, so that's one thing. The second benefit we saw is that these models are not just, uh, you know, like, a, um, how should I say it? You, you don't have to kind of move your data to fit what the model can do, do. These models are actually quite flexible and they can kind of be tailored to address different problems. So as you saw, whether it's a long-term problem versus short-term um, or like in more specific questions, whether you care more about the survival problem or a classification problem of whether something fails or not, and you just really don't care about the exact kind of a curve or, or time, then optimal trees can, can all do that pretty efficiently. And third one, and again, that's the one that I am personally most excited about, is that it works really well with limited data. So, you know, with the power to combine the trees and also the censoring that have been used quite widely in the survival analysis, you can really take advantage of the censored data that even though you don't really get to observe its entire um, history, um, if you only have one year rather than three years, you can still get something quite useful and some kind of insights out of it. And I found that quite, uh, quite interesting. So we actually have some applications in healthcare with exactly um, that kind of setup where, you know, like if uh, the drug is uh, really, really useful, then the patients don't actually experience um, mortality or other negative effects. So being able to take advantage of censoring in that scenario also allows us to, to have less data, but uh, still as much insight as we can. Um, so another side note about the model performance, I didn't go into details, um, but if you're interested, um, we did a whole series of analysis on the survival outcome and classification outcome in terms of predictive um, accuracy, and they are very similar to the black box models. Um, so again, if you're interested, in, we have the details in the paper. So yeah, and Andy, with that, I think uh, it wraps up my side of the presentation. All right. Th thank you. That was that was great. Um, uh, if you haven't already started, why don't you uh, type in some questions here? And uh, while well, I got a couple of things to just kind of uh, pick up here. Uh, first, the folks at Interpretal are actually going to be presenting this paper um, along with some of the other works that they do at an upcoming conference, the INFORMS conference. So uh, that's down in uh, Anaheim, I think. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. That's right. Uh, it's also virtual, by the way, so uh, you don't have to go. Uh, you don't have to go if you don't want to. Uh, but uh, there's all kinds of wonderful sessions there. Uh, and Backblaze, uh, obviously, we talk lots of different things. Uh, we have webinars coming up on ransomware, and, and that's in a couple of weeks. Um, developer Day. So if any of you are developers or no no friends who are, uh, this is our very first Developer Day. We're really proud of this. Um, couple of hours worth of everything we could throw at you in two hours uh, related to that. Uh, and then um, the hard drive stats, we do them every quarter. The new numbers uh, will be published uh, on November, November 4th, we'll do the webinar uh, and, uh, and you'll be able to listen in. We're actually over, um, I can tell you this, 190,000 drives these days. Uh, yeah. So may maybe we need to go back and look at things. Uh, a little bit better um, <laughs> and see how we're doing. You know, one of the things I found really interesting um, as, as we went through it here, you were talking about limited data. One of the challenges we have is bringing, uh, bringing new drives on, drive models on. We get them in and we test them 
and we're we we don't have a lot of data. We we might have them running in a test environment for three three months or so on and so forth, and then we we go okay, these look solid, and we put them into the production environment, uh, and then we monitor them, of course, with the smart stats. But having the ability to do something like this, even uh, at that with that minimum amount of data, that three, six, less than a year's worth of data, um, gives us uh, two advantages. One is we can see how they're doing, um, and maybe there's um, maybe there's a canary, uh, you know, in the coal mine kind of thing happening that we just wouldn't see before until it manifests itself uh, some way or another, uh, and and that's really important. And then the second one is this gives us an idea of where to look because of the the nature mm -hmm. of being open, um, and so if we suddenly start seeing a particular attribute or combination of attributes that are really problematic, that's going to lead to, is it, is it media errors or is, it, is there something else? Or is it, our, is it uh, the interaction of our software or the, or the firmware that's on there? Uh, you know, whatever the case may be. So I think this could provide some really valuable insight for that. R related to that, there was, um, this is a little bit of a self-serving question, but um, given all of this, um, how would you uh, use this, everything you've discovered, um, if you were Backblaze, if you were us, and now you know what you know, and you've done this, uh, what would you do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, maybe I share a story of a similar kind of a predictive maintenance case that we did with a car manufacturer. Um, so again, you know, they were very interested in predicting what leads to their welding guns failure. Um, and we built a similar decision tree model that told them, you know, under certain pressure and certain temperature, um, these uh, gun heads are much more likely to break. So I think to them, they found the two most useful uh, uses out of it. The first one is uh, kind of a, a, a predict again, like optimizing when to maintain and when to replace these welding guns. So because, you know, each time if they have to take it down, the, the downtime is going to really hurt their production value. So being able to really pinpoint on uh, when they should uh, take it down and to do their maintenance is a, is a, in terms of operational cost. It's just a very, very useful. The second thing to them is actually because of these uh, combination of conditions that we found things like, you know, certain, again, temperature and pressure combinations, they were actually able to f have their like floor engineers to like look at them and kind of start tweaking these numbers. So, you know, one of the splits, for example, we found was that the pressure is under 2000, um, that things tend to break more often. So they start now kind of changing the machine setting and see, you know, oh, like if it's under 2000, can we kind of tune it up and make it 2100, just as an example. And by doing that, it actually gives them a really nice framework to make new experiments and to design kind of better machine settings for um, for you know reducing the downtime so again i'm not exactly sure for hard drives how translatable that is you know how many of these metrics can actually be be tuned or to be monitored not uh, more actively but if there is a, such a potential i do think having these models not only would give you a better prediction but it allows you to just you know adjust for how how you can help make these drives healthier as well yeah, so there, there was an interesting thing that cropped up in your study that um, you pointed out in the paper, which I thought was great, um, the notion of temperature. And uh, Google started way back in 2007 and said basically not much of an impact. And we've done a couple of other studies as we've gone along and done the same kind of a thing. And the which if, what we found, of course, is the temperature is, and same thing that Google found, you can crank the temperature up in your data center, for example. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be a meat locker. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you can still get, the drives can still function and they're well within spec, but not only that, they seem to behave themselves. But one of the things that creeped in, especially on the short-term one, was that it was temperature as a factor. Um, and and so we, we should dig into that mm -hmm. um, and see if that's, um, if that's uh, you know really the case, 
if it matters or if it just matters uh, in a given period of time, like when the drives are young or, uh, and is there a range of temperatures? So, so it gives us uh, a place uh, to look, um, you know, uh, and, and, and question some of the things that we see. Temperature is exactly one of the factors that we can, we can impact every day. The other things might be, um, you know, obviously vibration, which of course we want to minimize. Um, you know, things of that, uh, drive speed, uh, is, is 7,200, the correct speed. What happens? We slow it down to 5,400. How do those models perform? Um, you know, all kinds of interesting, uh, things like that, uh, that we might be able to get some impact on. Yeah. It's really interesting. You mentioned the temperature part, because I think that's sort of one of the downside for the univariate analysis is that, you know, on the grand scheme of things, it doesn't pop up, right. When you're just looking at its impact, but when you are able to kind of find these segments and the model does tell you exactly which segments to, to look now it actually finds maybe the effect is actually huge. It just kind of gets washed out if you don't do this kind of tree like segmentation. So yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the, the key outputs that we are very excited about. Excellent. All right. So uh, we have a couple of, uh, but we're running a little short on time here. So what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of, uh, you know, I, um, I want to make sure that uh, I let everybody remind everybody that we, we have uh, the attachments out there. Um, if you ask the question, and there are a couple that we didn't get a chance to get to, uh, we'll answer them via email, uh, either myself or, uh, or Daisy will get back to you. So you, you will get an answer. Uh, remember, uh, if you do want to have the, your friends of yours watch this or a colleague, as the case may be, it's the same URL. They just in log into your back bright talk account, excuse me. Uh, and you'll be ready to go with that. Uh, Daisy, thank you. Uh, this has been enlightening. I really enjoyed, um, I enjoyed reading the paper from, um, uh, like I said, I said in in the in the blog post we did a couple of days ago, um, the uh, I I understood it. I and I was open and I could see exactly what you were talking about, the whole notion of being interpretable, um, and and that's that was really powerful to me. Uh, it was also well written, um, and uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, very approachable. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for, again for the opportunity for us to share some of our findings with everyone. Excellent. And I want to thank the audience for hanging in there. This was great and appreciate you. Uh, please share if you think it's appropriate. Um, and we hope to see you on another webcast in the future. With that, have a good day and thank you.